Salutations, my lovely listeners. I hope you've made yourself comfortable. Welcome to Jackie Just Chatters. I'm your hostess, Jackie Lentz. Gather round as I talk about bathrooms. I try to come up with some really clever way to introduce this subject, but those hopes were flushed down the drain. I like bathrooms. Not all bathrooms, mind you, but fancy ones. Elegant ones, the kind that make you pull out your camera and take a picture or a video. Chicago is home to two noteworthy lavatories. One is in Tiffany's. Yes, that Tiffany's and Company on the Magnificent Mile. If you find yourself in the city, it is worth going in and ooing and eyeing over the pretty shinies. But while you are there, drop in and use their toilets. At least those are free. Not far away from Tiffany's is 875 North Michigan Avenue, formerly the John Hancock Center and in my opinion will always be the John Hancock. Skip the observation level. Right underneath is a bar and restaurant. For about the same price of going to the observation deck, you can get a drink and take in the view. One of the best views that look out on the city can also be had in the women's bathroom on that floor. It is simply breathtaking. However, it is only in the women's. So, sorry guys, you are, uh, you know what out of luck. Last on my amazing bathroom list is at Fortnum and Mason in London. The loo, as they call it across the pond, has those half cloth, half paper towels to dry your hands Man, those are so fancy in my opinion. There are marble on the floors, gilded mirrors to fix your makeup. The lighting is provided by crystal chandeliers. In fact, I took a movie of that bathroom so I could share it with my sister when I got home. It was that impressive. Do you know of any remarkable restrooms? I want to hear about them. So tell me about them, or better yet, share a picture if you've got one. Head over to my Jackie Lentz author Facebook page. The link can be found in the description and leave me a post. I'm always looking for travel inspiration. I'm going to read a little tidbit from Alice's Adventure in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll. The caterpillar and Alice looked at each other for some time in silence. At last the caterpillar took the hookah out of his mouth and addressed her in a languid, sleepy voice. Who are you? said the caterpillar. This was not an encouraging opening for a conversation. Alice replied rather shyly, I I hardly know, sir, just at present. At least I know who I was when I got up this morning, but I think I must have been changed several times since then. What do you mean by that? said the caterpillar sternly. Explain yourself. I can't explain myself, I'm afraid, sir, said Alice, because I'm not myself, you see. The caterpillar may not have understood Alice, but I know exactly what she is talking about. This idea of knowing who you are in literature is not new. The bard gave us, To thine own self be true. That is a lot easier said than done, Shakespeare, my friend. I've begun to notice a trend in TV and movies, and this is kind of more popular in the sci-fi and fantasy genre. There's a moment. When the hero is asked the same question, the caterpillar asked Alice, Who are you? It tends to be this very dramatic moment in the story. 
Justly so, it is a complex question. Also, one that is very hard to answer, I feel. This is my main topic for the episode. Why is the question of who are you so hard to answer? I think there are three main reasons it is so challenging. I classify them as where, when, and knowledge. I'll start with where. Who I am often depends on where I am. I demonstrate different parts of my personality and tuck others away based on where I am and what is socially called for. I think back when I started teaching. Very quickly, my brain separated itself into what my students called Ms. Lentz. That was my teacher self. She never swore, was rules-based, didn't share her personal thoughts about political topics. I usually just argued for the side that was the opposite of whatever was the dominant view in the room. I was trying to help them see multiple points of view. And a big thank you to my debate class teacher, Mrs. Kendall, for allowing me the ability to fight for basically any side of an issue. If it wasn't for that debate class, I think I would have been in big trouble. Ms. Lentz cared about getting homework done on time, and she loved her subjects. At home, I was Jackie, who still loved those same subjects passionately, but that side of me swore like a sailor, was quick to share my feelings and tastes about every subject, and was pretty flexible about rules and deadlines. I was really both of these women, but different sides of my personality came out in different places. Neither was false or my more true self. Who I was depended on who I needed to be and outside factors influencing me. Here's a little side story for you. Once at my desk, I swore. I, I had a little problem with my computer and I said a word that rhymes with the word hit and a student overheard me. Well, this student starts telling the other kids, oh, Miss Lent swore and starts trying to tell all these other and the other kids are like, what? No, no, Miss Lentz never swears. She doesn't do that. And he's looking at me. He's expecting me to support him, to validate that and admit that I actually swore and and did this. I didn't. I threw him under the bus and I looked at him with derision and I was like, Ugh, why would you lie about me like that? Everyone knows I don't swear. And the other kids are like, yeah, that wasn't cool, man. And the look of betrayal on his face and then when the other kids were doing their work, I gave him a look. Like, you just don't cross me like that. You better know better next time. That, uh, you know, you gotta watch who you tangle with, folks. But really, I think all of us have this sort of Superman, Clark Kent ability that we can be different selves in different places. Next is when. We all evolve over time. Thank goodness. I frequently make reference to the fact that I've been probably at least six Jackies by now, maybe more. Who I am depends on when you're asking. Who I was at 20 is not the same person I was at 28 and certainly not the same person I am now. Sure, some things stay the same and some parts of your story can leave and then come back. When I was in my teens, I was dealing with a body and hormones I couldn't control or fully understand. Now that I'm in my mid-late 40s and slugging through perimenopause, I find that I'm feeling like that teenager all over again. In my college years, as I was becoming an adult, I was overwhelmed with how much I didn't know about the world. By the time I hit my 30s, I began to feel pretty superior and worldly with the wisdom that I had acquired in the past decade, thus giving birth to my judgy 30s, as I call them. This was kind of an ugly part of my personality, I'm going to fully admit it. I thought I had figured it out, and I was ready to tell the world the right and the wrong way to do things. Oh, Facebook. 
how you are just a magnet for myself and others who suffer with judgy 30s. In my 40s, I started to cope with way too many losses of loved ones passing. And I noticed how I grieved differently each time I lost someone and how those around me grieved in their own way. This really helped me understand that we all have our own paths and we have to walk our own way. My judgment didn't help anyone and it didn't even help me. Since then, I've increased my compassion and flexibility. I've been walking further away from my superior self and I've been trying to let go of the shame that I feel for having been so judgy back then and honestly, probably still more judgy than I should be now. Knowing who you are lastly requires honest knowledge. You have to be willing to take time to earnestly look inside. Many of us do not want to do this task. It can be uncomfortable to gaze upon the parts of yourself that you label as defective. This can bring forth shame. It can be just as uncomfortable to accept and declare our strengths. There is such a great push to downplay our accomplishments, especially for women. Sadly, many cross the line from humility to self-degradation. But honest knowledge is not about putting labels of good or bad on your characteristics. Unless you want to, it is just a settling of accounts. What makes you laugh? feel safe, content, loved. These are probably some good things to know about yourself. I'm currently going through a transitional phase right now. For two decades, I was defined by my role as an educator. Once a teacher, always a teacher. But that is not the main focus of my life anymore. Instead, it has been usurped by that of being a writer and storyteller. Thanks to my debut novel, which I am... Still editing. It is a slow process. Or, well, you know what? No, I'm just slow. That's, there's some honesty for you. I'm slow at it, but I'm still, still working at it. I'm, I'm a lot closer. I'm, I've got less than a third to go between the novel and this podcast, which, oh, it gives me so much joy. I love this outlet for my creativity, but I'm also going through a change in my appearance as well. During the pandemic, I became a fan of watching vintage hair and fashion creators on YouTube. This was something brand new to me. I had never done that before. And I've become a huge fan of Rachel Maxey. Highly recommend checking her out. She is a hoot. She is a vibrant, fun, and inventive woman. She started doing more vintage focused material and over the years she has expanded her interest. I've learned a lot from her and she is a great inspiration to me. One of the things she just encourages you to do is, hey, just try it. Go for it. I've always had a soft spot for the music and style of the 40s and 50s. Nothing gives that vintage appearance like some red lipstick and a head of curls. The lipstick is pretty easy to achieve. The curls have been more difficult. I've explored using a curling iron, but they don't last long. There are so many tips and videos about doing a wet set. What's a wet set? Wet set means you put your hair in curlers when it is wet or damp and let it dry. These results are the best for curls and your curls will last more than just a day. But the process is very involved. But I decided, hey, I'm gonna go for it. And I began to assemble the items I would need to do this. First, let me say I was not going to sleep in curlers. I did that as a child and forget it. It is too painful, I don't like it. I found a video that was like kind of a cheat version of it. You get your hair damp, then you put in a styling solution, which is absolutely required. Wet alone is not gonna get those curls to stay. So you have damp hair, styling solution, and then you 
roll up the curls. You put them in these curlers. I had first ordered some pink rollers from Amazon and they arrived at my house and they came flat as pancakes. Oh my gosh, they were not rolling anything. So then I went to one of those dollar stores and picked up their pink rollers and then also these long foam rollers that fold over on themselves as another option, which was really good that I got the fold over option because the pink foam rollers with the plastic frame, the plastic frame just completely fell off the rollers. Um, if you did not keep the tension 100%, which you can't do when you're rolling it, they would just fall apart. Uh, they weren't even worth the dollar I paid for them, but thankfully I didn't spend a lot of money. So I switched over to these long stick foamy rollers. Doing my whole head took about an hour, I think. It was kind of a blur. Um, I actually even had Kevin come in and help with the back of my head because I've got really long hair and I couldn't see what I was doing and I'm trying to roll it and I'm getting frustrated by this point and I just, I needed a little companion help. So after that was done, I put on the hair bonnet. What's a hair bonnet? This is a device that looks like a shower cap that goes over your head and is hooked up to a hose that's attached to a hair dryer. It is completely from the 50s and 60s. This is a vintage item, but it's still used. It was brand new. I just bought it. I set it for medium heat and I let it go for like 30, 40 minutes. Then after that time, you have to let your hair cool because if you take out your curls when they are warm, they'll just droop and they lose all their curl. Well, I messed up. Not all my hair was dry, but most of it was. And I, my patience had ran out. I, I just, I took it out. Overall, I was pretty happy with how the curls turned out. And they looked pretty good the next day, too. It was worth it. It was worth doing again. I, I definitely learned, like, you know, you, you got to give it a little extra time. Maybe I'll, I'll even share some of the photos of my in-process on, on Facebook. It, it, it's pretty crazy looking, I, I got to admit. I do feel that the curls and the red lipstick give a vintage charm. And I, I like the the overall fact. I enjoy the fact that I'm in my 40s, edging towards 50, let's be honest. And I'm giving myself a makeover, a physical and mental makeover. Our patterns are not set when we hit 30. Our lives are not finished at that age either. We still have lots of adventures ahead of us. There's so much more fun and change to come. And I'm looking forward to what is coming into my near future. I've been many versions of myself, but I must say this is the first time I've ever been aware of the process of changing from one version to another version as it was happening. There's definitely a bit of a surreal quality about it. Who we are is always in flux. It is a simple question, who are you? But it is almost impossible to answer. But I like a challenge, so I'm gonna give it my best. Who is Jackie? I am a teacher, a storyteller, a wife, a daughter, a sister, a friend. I am stubborn, sarcastic, compassionate, bossy, the generous one, the queen, and someone who is capable of feeling two diametrically opposed emotions at the same time. Who are you? What has helped you find out who you are? Or what has been a block to you answering this question? Tell me your story over at my Jackie Lens author Facebook page.
Before I wrap up this episode, I have a quick heartwarming story. Media focuses on the sensational and fear-mongering because, sadly, it works getting viewers and ad revenue. This is true for left, right, and middle folks. Hey, they gotta pay the bills. This often can create a false impression that the world is a lot more darker and sinister than the reality. Because kindness, generosity, and a lack of something bad happening doesn't have the same spark for the news. I don't have to worry about those same issues, though. So let me give you a dose of positivity. I'm going to share a story I just heard. A friend of mine, let's call her Madam X, has been going to the hospital on a regular basis to visit her husband who has an ongoing illness. Madam X was grateful for the support of friends and family, and it's really helped her keep going. Recently, one day, she was presented with an opportunity to pass it on. An elderly woman approached the more gourmet food counter the hospital offered, besides the usual cafeteria, and she had a coupon. Sadly, the coupon was only good for the cafeteria and not this more fancy area. The woman looked defeated. Madam X marched up to the woman and said, Oh, today there is a special. There's a buy one meal, get one meal free. I'm going to give my free meal to you. I don't need it. The worker behind the counter exchanged glances with Madam X and nodded his understanding. Of course, there was no deal. But he knew what she was doing and he was going to play along. So the small old lady was elated not only at getting her meal, but for her, it was a free special deal. So she got her food and a drink. Don't we all love a deal? Madam X felt so good about paying it forward and and helping someone else, giving her a sense of control that once a week, she did the same thing over and over. She would pick someone out who looked like they really needed a pick-me-up and she would offer them her fictional free extra meal. The manager of the counter finally confronted her at one point. No one was in earshot, mind you. Like, no one was hearing this but her. And she's like, she'd notice. She's like, hey, you've been doing this for four weeks. I see you. I know what you're doing. And that's wonderful. Madam X was really stunned and surprised that anybody was, was keeping track, that anyone noticed this. But hey, we see, we feel these things. They're important. My mom, Madam X, and I spent a few pleasant moments thinking about all the positive cascading effects these meals might have created. Letting somebody cut ahead of you in traffic. Being more patient and upbeat while visiting their sick loved ones in the hospital and so on. You get it. Remember, folks, There are a lot of Madam X's out there, quietly doing acts of kindness, spreading compassion in tiny ripples. I'm going to quote Louis Armstrong here, and I think to myself, what a wonderful world. Thank you listeners for joining me. Remember, you can follow on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and iHeartRadio, or you can find me, like, and subscribe on YouTube. My regular episodes come out every other Thursday. If you are enjoying these podcasts, I would be delighted if you shared with your friends, left a rating on Spotify, or review on Apple Podcast. I hope you will come back for my next episode when I have a very special Mother's Day edition because I chat with my mom, including hearing about her days as a stewardess. You won't want to miss it. Until then, I wish you well.